Salutations dear viewers, this is George from Ireland and I'm continuing my series about the Third Reich for A-level history, that's Nazi Germany. So I'll pick up where I left off, um, about 1934, um, Gleichschaltung, that's the policy of harmonisation. It had started soon after the Nazis came to office in 1933. Um, so I talked about how um, the Nazis persecuted minority Christian sects such as the Quakers and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, the Nazis encourage people to greet each other and indeed say goodbye with Heil Hitler, but some people who were mildly dissident uh, would just say hello or goodbye, in German of course. Um, these people would draw suspicion on themselves, but to begin with, that wasn't enough to have a person sent to a concentration camp. Um, so uh, the SS was expanded considerably, the SA had been purged in 1934. Just a handful of members of the top had been killed. Indeed, at the Nuremberg rally in September 1934, uh, Hitler had um, said that uh, the great majority of SA men were decent, were just a few bad apples they'd had to uh, get rid of. The SA continued to exist right until the end of the Third Reich. However, it was smaller and less important than uh, the uh, SS. Uh, right, so what else? So people uh, joined the SA, and indeed the SS, for opportunistic reasons, just because they wanted a career. Even before the Nazis came to office, some employers said, if you show up to the job interview in an SA uniform, you're much more likely to get a job. And uh, unemployment was falling um, quite fast in, in the 1930s under the Nazis. They did things such as create the Reich Labour Service, or the um, RAD, and so young men having to work on construction projects or fell trees, things like that, if they were um, unemployed. Um, so uh, the SS, as I say, rose in importance and prestige. It was completely steeped in Nazi ideology. It had been created by the Nazi party originally. It wasn't created by the German government as such. Um, there was the Waffen SS, it's an armed SS, who were going to do some combat duties. There were the death's head units and uh, time they ran the extermination camps, as well as the concentration camps. The SS were, strictly speaking, police, but they didn't do ordinary policing. So they tried to keep an eye on the underground political parties, such as the um, SPD, as in the Socialists. Um, so the Socialists, they compiled reports on public opinion, and they noticed that people grumbled, that wages weren't really rising, but people were glad that unemployment was falling. So people often talk about the Third Reich as having a polycratic regime. That's ancient Greek, Greek poly, many kratos powers. So overlapping areas of responsibility. There was the SS, which had its own intelligence units, the SD, as in Sicherheitsdienst, literally um, security service, was the ordinary police. There was the Gestapo, Geheimer Staatspolizei, that's a secret police. And so one of the army had its own intelligence unit and so there were turf wars. You can imagine them squabbling these agencies when something was the responsibility of more than one agency. So people say that despite this um, image of order and uh, dictatorship under the Third Reich, really it was the greatest chaos that Germany had ever seen. Um, there were um, several attempts to uh, kill Hitler. These assassination did, these attempts did not come off. But the fact that these plots got so far showed that uh, the uh, German intelligence at the time was not highly effectual. Um, right, so uh, yeah, one historian said, the greatest period of chaos Germany has ever seen. That's what it was like. So there's much truth in that. And all authority came from Hitler because he was the Fuhrer. Uh, so he disliked cities in general. He particularly disliked Berlin. He saw it as a hotbed of socialism and Judaism. He spent a lot of his time at the Berghof in the Obersalzburg. That's the extreme south of Germany. Um, so he was an idler. He awoke a little bit before noon. He wasn't a details man, so important things didn't make it onto a radar screen. He read very little. He detested paperwork. Often people could get crucial decisions out of him without him having asked to see the files or consult experts' opinion. So he just gave verbal commands. People could willfully misinterpret these or just accidentally misunderstand them. People he could invent uh, verbal commands. He was vague, he'd give an objective, and he wouldn't say how to reach that objective. He wasn't inquisitive, he was very inconsistent. There were lots of policy U-turns, performing a volte farce about whether the South Tyrol was supposed to be part of Germany or not. So people would claim they were working on the Führer's authority. People talk about 
working towards the Fuhrer doing what they assumed Hitler wanted them to do. Therefore, controlling access to Hitler was crucial. Whoever uh, got face time with him was likely to get the decision they wanted of this person. Hitler's secretary was Martin Bormann, and he did not do the typing. The secretary was a very high office in this case. Um, so um, people could use the claim that they were acting on Hitler's orders to exert social control. It's notable how the Nazis tried to exploit popular prejudices, didn't try to change public opinion. Um, anyway, so they harnessed people's prejudice to their own ends. Let's say there was anti-Semitism, but the level of it wasn't that high in 1933, so the Nazis really had to whip it up and demonize the uh, Jewish minority. Um, let me see. So they, they, they use this pre-existing anti-Semitic sentiment for their own ends, likewise, some people were against socialists or religious minorities such as Quakers, um, but the prejudice wasn't severe, wasn't widespread, so the Nazis had to make it more visceral. Racism towards Eastern Europeans, yes, it existed, but not amongst everyone, and it wasn't as vicious as it was to later become. Um, so there's but remarkably little um, opposition to this. They'd intensified anti-Semitism, making it something far, far more extreme, leading to the Holocaust in the end. Uh, you ought to read Daniel, uh, Daniel Jonah Gerhardt-Hagen's book, Hitler's Willing Executioners, and he claimed that ordinary Germans knew precisely what was going on in relation to the Holocaust, um, and very few disagreed with it, even privately. Many were indifferent, and some were indeed enthusiastic about it. So, um, and, but uh, for reasons of let's say, diplomacy and decency, people tried to excuse the majority of German people after the uh, Second World War, when both sides of the Cold War wanted to have a cordial working relationship with the two Germanys. Anyway, so uh, that's enough at the moment for uh, the early days of Gleichschaltung.